All right, folks. Now, if you want to talk about a real pleasure, I've been looking forward to this for weeks. And for those of you who don't know him, and that would be very few people, I think, I will introduce to you one guy, Hovis, who has been a very good friend of mine for over 60 oh, years, yeah. right? And oh, we were yeah. in college then, right? That's we were right. in college then, so you can do yeah. the math. Um, we were at Ole Miss together. I yes, see that sir. you do have your uh, Ole Miss shirt on. Uh, you're happy. Yeah, that's not a bug on my collar, but it's a microphone. <laughs> yeah, that yeah. is an Ole Miss helmet there, and uh, I can't remember who gave me this shirt, but I, I said, that's one of my favorite Ole Miss shirts. Well, you immediately have half of the audience out there hating both I of know us. It. <laughs> <laughs> I know it. I don't know. I was so proud of our Ole Miss baseball team and Mississippi State's baseball team having back-to-back -back National champions. That's just something. It's not you know, wouldn't it be neat if people. Southern picks it up next year? Wouldn't it? Yeah. Then put <laughs> I Mississippi forgot on who the it was. I think it was Rick Cleveland who said, you know, if Ole Miss State ever played against each other at Omaha, they'd have to find 20,000 more seats. <laughs> well, they would. Fill that thing up this yeah, year. That's didn't. true. I'm yeah. so glad to finally get out here to Shotco. Well, I'm For the second time. Here. Well, I learned, but second time, folks, because the first time we did it about two or three months ago, yeah. and I um, we messed had a little up technical. the equipment. I had a technical <laughs> thing that I he did the whole whole conversation, and I had pushed the wrong button. So this is the well, second go around, and hopefully this one works. If it doesn't, it, we'll we'll just give you your money back. How's that? <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I was talking to the audience. Uh. <laughs> I got you. Guy was born in Tupelo, right? Mississippi. That's yeah, right. Old Mississippi boy. Tupelo, Mississippi, me and Elvis. You and Elvis. Yeah. Okay. Well, both of And you... quite a few other folks, too. That, are, But, uh, yeah, El no matter how, if I became president, I, Tupelo would still be Elvis's hometown. <laughs> and one thing that, I, that we did talk about before was your father was one of the original highway patrol one of the original 52, 1938, when they organized the Highway Patrol. And he was. There's, that's one connection that we have, because when I was at 5 EM, the Highway Patrol was one of my accounts. Actually, it's yeah. my favorite account, because they were some, I mean, that was a bunch of characters. I loved them. <laughs> you know, they were. So, yeah. Well, yeah. then, Ole Miss time, right? Well... Ole Miss came, I guess, after I, I, I got through high school in Tupelo. And uh, I, I mean, I always guess I was going to go to Ole Miss because my best friends were over there. And my best friend, Bill Eubank, was a year ahead of him. He went over there. So I followed him over there and also followed him in what he studied. I didn't know what I was going to study. And he was majoring in accounting. And, uh, and our fraternity faculty advisor happened to be the I think he might have been the head of the accounting department. He was definitely the best teacher. And he said, well, if you don't really know what you want to do, this accounting will be a, be a good background. So I majored in accounting at Ole Miss. And, uh, but, you know, I sang, I always sang. I sang in high school in all the little productions, had a quartet that sang in high school and, and uh, sang at Ole Miss and a, a couple of musical productions there, you know. So I sung all my life, from the time I was about five years old, Harrisburg Baptist Church. Uh, so I, I always had, uh, you know, kind of dreams of maybe being a, a singing person. I mean, a music in the music business. Well, you also sang in a quartet at Ole Miss. Oh yeah, Sigmund. Right. Yeah, our, our fraternity Sigmund. Uh, Trent Lott, Galen Roberts, Alan Pepper, and I. Met up on the night we pledged, sitting around the piano, and we we all like to sing, so uh, we just got us a little quartet together, and uh, uh, we even went up to to Memphis to one of those recording studios. We still think it was Sun, but I'm not sure it was uh, in Sun Records. But anyhow, we recorded a, a little uh, record of about six songs that. Uh, and we sung, you know, we sang at the Sigma New National Convention. We sang a lot of stuff at Ole Miss. And uh, we kept getting together. 
that we got together every year until we lost Pepper. He died about ten years ago now. now he he was a he judge. Was our he, base he was a singer. judge. Yeah, right. judge Pepper, Pepper. Was, Pepper became a judge. Became a federal judge. He really did. And Trent Lott, my, I lost <laughs> track of him. I don't know exactly where he went after college, but uh. <laughs> right. <laughs> Everybody knows where Trent Lott went, and uh, he's still there too. Yeah. Boy, he's still working away. Um, I worked for him for years. It's uh, of course the senator. Yeah, we'll talk about that later. This course the senator, Senator Trent Light. Senator Trent. And, uh, Galen Roberts. I don't know where he is now. Do yeah. You? Who's that? Galen. Galen it lives just north of Atlanta. He's he's retired. He's a Air Force Colonel. Wow. He had a career in Air Force, and then he got into some kind of consulting business. That I know he went all over the world for a while. Uh, uh, but he and his uh, wife, Joanna, settled in Canton, Georgia. Well, speaking of going into the military, you did that right after Ole Miss, too, didn't you? Well, I did. It was a, a godsend, too, really, because I had majored in accounting. And when I graduated, I had about six months before I was going to have to go into the Army because I had an ROTC commission at, uh, out of college. And that six months, I went to work... <laughs> for Pete Morgan Mitchell, public accounting firm in Jackson. And the first job they sent me on was an audit at Taylor Machine Works in Louisville. I counted nuts and bolts for about <laughs> two weeks. And I said, huh, I don't believe I'm going to be able to make it in, in this field. How long am I have to do this? <laughs> so, yeah, I had to go to the Army uh, six, uh, six months after I got out of school. So, uh, Never. I did, after I got out of the Army, I did go back to Ole Miss and try to pass CPA exam, which I never did. Well, but let's talk about that Army for just a minute. I, I got a few things I can, I can tell them about that. Now you you were in the artillery. I was. Field artillery. Went to Fort Sill. Yes, sir. So did I. Yeah. About five or six years ahead of you. Yeah. Uh, but you also were kept there as an instructor in an OCS, an officer's candidate I was. School, right? Which means that you were very high in your class, in that artillery class. They don't, they they sent the ones like me out to the fighting batteries. <laughs> they kept you well, <laughs> I, so you could teach the rest of them. I kept trying to get out of there. I mean, I even went to jump school. Yeah, got <laughs> Benny. Yeah. I, and I, I, I tried a lot of things to get transferred. I really actually tried to go to Vietnam. Like I said, the Lord was looking out for me because I never got there. They kept sending me back to Fort Seal, sending me back to Fort Seal. And that's where I finished my tour of duty. Yeah. But in the meantime, while you were there, you also did a little stint, singing stint while you were there, too, in the Army. I did. Toward the end of my uh, second year, they were having a little contest on the base, uh, talent contest, and the winners were going to go on this tour of the 4th Army District. And this, uh, they talked me, a couple of guys talked me into entering that thing. I said, man, and dang if I didn't win. And the, and the commandant at OCS was not real happy about it because that meant I was going to go on this tour, and he was going to have to replace me for six weeks. So they wound up making me officer in charge of the tour. Boy, was that an experience. I learned about a lot about uh, musicians and performers and their personalities. And, and as a brand spanking new <laughs> second lieutenant. Whoa. Yeah. But it was, a, it was a really good experience. It's the first time I'd really, it really had any close contact with the people that were. These, most of these guys have been in show business. They, they were in the Army. Which brings me all the way back to high school, which is, you know, I've had a lot of angels in my life, but I guess the, the one I can mention right now in high school is Lou Ann Pepper. Oh, yeah. Who came to Tupelo High to practice teach between her junior and senior year of college. And Lou Ann had already been to New York and sung with the Vincent Lopez Orchestra. I mean, she, she knew about the business. And she's the first person, you know, I mean, that I knew that had, had any experience in the music business who told me that she thought I had what it, the talent to be able to, to do something in the music business. And I carried that with me for a, as long until I finally did make that break and go to California. 
you know, you and I talked the time you were out here before, one of the great mysteries of this world is why somebody like Lou Ann Pepper would marry somebody like George Payne Cossard Jr. from Charleston, Mississippi. You know, I never understood that, but. Well, well, none of us have, but <laughs> what a blessing it was for the town of Charleston. That sure was. It yeah, was. She, she has been such a, a contributor in so many ways there up she, until she, she just lost her lost a couple her. of years not ago. Long, not long ago. Well, yeah. and we still miss her. Yeah. Okay. So after that spent in the Army, um, you went back to school. Went back to graduate school. Um, Try to get a master's degree yeah, in accounting. Yeah, master's and tried to pass CPA. And during that time is when the, all my buddies there at the, they were still in the school said, man, you really you really need to take a shot at the music business. Are you going to look back far down your life and say, I wish I'd have tried it, you know? So, you know, I, I did after, after, actually, I think it was after one semester. It was because I left in like, July of the, yeah, then I got out of the Army in January. So it was like for one semester, tried to teach CPA exam, then I packed up my old Pontiac Catalina and headed for California. I don't know what in the world, I didn't have enough money to last but about a week. And uh, it's just the Lord looking looking out for me. Well, we and, had an old fraternity brother out there at that time. Well, Tom, that's, Tommy Lester, Tom Lester was there, wasn't he? Tom Lester, who wandered out there himself and wound up on the Green Acres TV show. And when I was trying to decide whether I was going to Nashville or New York or L.A., I called him and uh, talked to him about it. He said, man, you, this is where you need to come. This is like mid-60s. He said, this, this is where it's happening, television-wise and everything else. And so you get on out here. He said, I, there's this little nightclub in Santa Monica, California, that has the... Uh, where they let young performers kind of audition, get up on the stage and learn how to perform. And uh, he told me the name of the guy there. And this was the horn. Right? The horn in Santa Monica. So I did, I, I went to the horn when I got out there. And uh, there's another angel in my life, the owner of the horn, Enrico Cuccinelli, who show business name was Rick Riccardi. Rick owned the horn. He started it after he'd retired from a career as a uh, head vocal coach at 20th Century Fox. Hmm. He worked with actors to get them to learn project their voice and stuff. Anyhow, Rick, they didn't, ha they didn't have a place for me to work when I got there, so he let me check IDs at the front door and do a little odd job. I even worked for his accountant for uh, about a year doing a little part-time work. But Rick is, just kind of took me under his wing. He, he, had a, he, he had a soft spot in his heart for Southerners because Jim, Jim Neighbors had started there. Andy Griffith was a good friend of his. And uh, they just kind of took care of me. And he, he taught me. He didn't try to do anything with my voice other than teach me how to use it where I didn't hurt myself singing about, for an hour at a time. Placement is what they called it. You can get it up out of your throat and talk through your mask, which when I speak now, I still don't speak properly, but I sing properly now because of Rick Riccardi. Hmm. That's interesting. Well, That's the only reason I can still sing at 80 years old, I guarantee you. Well, when you go in there and talk to, a, to the head of a place like that, you just walk in and say, I'm Guy Hose from oh, Mississippi, and I want to I wanna talk to you about you. You just well, approach it that way? I was so shy, man. I was, I was pissed. But Tom Lester uh, told me about this guy that worked there at the Horn. It was a friend of his. He said, go see David Blaylock. David King was his name at that time. He changed his name a couple of times. Go see David and talk to him and see, get him to introduce you to Rick and see if they could have any place for you there. So David took me over and introduced me to Rick and his wife, Margaret, who really ran the place. And uh, that was it. that was it. If he, I don't know if I'd ever gone up and asked him to introduce myself or what. I don't know what, but David introduced me, and uh, you know that's just that's just a lesson in in networking. If you hadn't had Tommy Lester, Tommy Lester, we called him Tiger, Tiger, and uh, out there, and he knew these folks, and they took you, you know, under their wing, and I, you know, it, it's you can't have too many folks in your network. 
That's yeah. true. Yeah. That's true. And I ask them not to, not to help you. But there are a lot of folks who will. Well, so you're in a horn now, and all of a sudden you get. Yeah, in the horn. Uh, they they finally got to where they'd let me get up on stage late at night after all the regular performers had finished. And uh, boy, I learned so much watching these performers that were there. But uh, yeah, I got to get up late at night, and I was I was singing about. 1.30 in the morning, one one night, and the producer of Art Linkletter's house party show came in with uh, his secretary, and they heard me, and they thought that I would be good for the Linkletter show. That was that kids say the darndest things, the house party show, it was a wonderful show. So I went down, and uh, I did one show, and they got so much mail, they kept asking me back. I did that show for about a year on CBS. I found out from that that no nobody in the business watched daytime television at that time. So I got really nothing, no recording contract, no anything out of, out of doing that TV show. So I went back and talked to the guy that had introduced me to Rick Ricardi, talked to David, and he was having the same problem. He was not able to get anywhere. Because it was a time in that 66, 67, when the there were male singers were a dime a dozen. Boy, they were everywhere. Tom Jones, Engelbert, Humberdink, all that group. So David and I decided we'd team up and, and, and uh, try a duo thing. And we did. We had great success with that. We got a contract on with ABC Records. We did an album with uh, Al Capps producing, who was a famous producer then. And... Um, it just, uh, we just never could really get a hit record after about two years. We did a lot of television shows. We did one entire week on Joey Bishop every night. And uh, just just really couldn't get anything going. I, uh, I think mainly because I think our, our manager at the time <laughs> decided after we'd done that week on Joey Bishop, we were stars. So he priced us out of the market. <laughs> I don't think we got but three or four jobs that whole year. So... Uh, well, how did you go about getting a manager? How, you know, do you rely on somebody to recommend something? Because I imagine those, you, there's a good chance you might not get the right kind of guy, right? That's exactly right. And uh, you just have to rely on other people that have had these people as managers or know, know people that have had them. Well, we got ours because they came in the horn and, and heard us. And uh, he, he, he really liked us. And... Uh, he, he got us to sign on with him, and I knew he had a good reputation. So, well, you and well, you and David, you did record an album. For we ABC. did. We recorded an album. It was a really good album. I never could get a hit record off of it. And there were some really good songs on it. But I mean, that it's just such a luck of the draw in the record business. And uh, you know, back in those days, there was a lot of payola and stuff going around to get songs played on the radio, and we. We just never did, and I don't know. It just worked. It, it was like most things. I think it just worked out like it was supposed to. Because during the time I was working with David, I'd met a little gal from Texas named Rawlna English, who came through the horn. She stopped through there to work on her act a little bit. She was opening act for Frank Sinatra Jr. and was traveling around the country with him. And anyhow, she came to the horn, and I met her. And one thing led to another. About a year or so later, we got married. And uh, so, <clears throat> and after we got married, she, she'd always wanted to do a spot on a Lawrence Welk show because her grandmother lived in Lawrence Welk show. I mean, Ronald was kind now, of a jazz. a lot of folks out there in the audience now who, don't, who didn't... Uh, don't know who Lawrence Welk is. Yeah, Believe me, I know yeah. that now. These yeah. young people, anybody <clears throat> under 50 now is like, who? Anyhow, <laughs> well, he was really big then. I he was it. big, boy. Top five show on TV. Yep. Anyhow, Ronald wanted to, to to do a shot on his show, so one of the guys who did musical arrangements for the show came in the horn, and she got him to set up a an audition for her. And I took my guitar down, and and uh, we sang for Lawrence. She sang a song for Lawrence, and you know, it was one of those things like that's so nice. But we really don't we can't have a place for you right now. Uh, but I'll call you when we do. So you went down there with her when she signed yeah, that? Yeah, oh, yeah, lady guitar. Okay. Yeah. So we figured that was one of those don't call us, we'll call you things. But 
lo and behold, about maybe three months, maybe not even that long later, one of the girls on the Welk Show quit. And they called Ronna and asked her to come be on the show. She still wasn't real sure she wanted to do it. She said, I'm, not, I'm just more of a jazz singer, you know. But me and some of her friends said, you know, a, a top five TV show watched by 40 million people a week, I believe you might want to just give it a shot. So she did. She got on that show, and uh, so she was traveling the Welk show, and I was traveling with David. We didn't see much of ourselves for about a year. She said, this ain't going to work. So she talked Lawrence into letting me come to do their Christmas show, sing a duet with her on the annual Christmas show where they brought all the kids and families in and everything. And uh, he did. He let me sing a show. We uh, sing a song called... Uh, Little toy trains. We did it with about 30 kids sitting around us. I thought, holy Moses, where is this going to go? But they were, they were, they turned out they were just as calm. And we sang the song. And, and yeah, Lawrence got tons of mail. He'd been on national television 15 years and never had a husband wife team on the show. So we were like an instant hit. And, uh, so I had to tell David, <laughs> I'm sorry, but I think I got a better offer here. <laughs> yeah. So I did. I joined the Welk Show in 1970. Ronald and I stayed on there all the way till the end in 84. I think we stopped doing shows. And then when the rerun started in 86 on PBS. And we did specials all the way up to 2008. Well, they're still and, running. Oh, a lot of parts of the country, the Lawrence Welch Show is still on and on PBS stations. Sorry, Mississippi quit carrying it two or three years ago. But you can still get it if you're close to Memphis or New Orleans or Mobile or Birmingham. You can, you can still pick it up. Well, those were, those were fun days. There, you got a picture of you in those days right there. You need to show the folks that picture. Guy. I'm, I don't really want yeah, to. Yeah, you do. You need to well, this is kind of, this was my publicity picture at one time. This is before I got on the Welk show now. Oh, really? Before? Yeah. Can you see that? See that? Oh, my, you with, handsome devil. With my afro. <laughs> As a matter of fact, the first time Ron and I went down to sing for Lawrence Welk, he mentioned to some of his staff, says, his hair is a little long. <laughs> <laughs> and it was. Pretty, he was pretty strict on dress and hair and everything. But, yeah, let's see. There's another another Afro picture. That's one of my publicity pictures. Oh, oh the girls would just melt. Oh, she, <laughs> uh, melt. There, there's me and Lawrence when I joined the show. A one and a two. A one and a two, yeah, it was a great time. Those it really days. was. They they were fun, and they were fun to watch. We used to watch you all all the time. I know him. <laughs> you know, well, we had a loyal following on that show. It was unbelievable. They been, I mean, it was just like going to church. They weren't gonna miss that Welk show on Saturday night. Well, I, I, you told me something once before, and I didn't know it, that that I asked you. you know, he had right or wrong the uh, reputation for really not paying top dollar for his people to sing. Mm -hmm. And you told me that the musicians, the uh, orchestra, actually were higher paid than, than the performers. Lawrence had a pretty good strategy on his paying people. He, had, he paid everybody the same. And that was whatever the union scale was for the show. The musician scale, union scale, was higher than the after scale, which is the performers. So they did make more than we did, but everybody on that show got paid the same. And that, it really, it really works well. I mean, that's really why the Leonard sisters wind up leaving the show because they just, they felt like they should get more money than others. And he said, well, good luck girls. <laughs> when they did, they did well, but, uh, yeah, he, he paid us all the same. We had to, of course, it wasn't enough to live on, uh, scale from a, a TV show, but we were, we were allowed to go out on weekends. It only took three or four days a week on in the studio filming the show. So we had Friday, Saturday, Sunday usually to go out around the country and do performances. And uh, 
That's how we made our our uh, money, really, through through the seventies. Well, and then um, you and Ronald stayed together for a while after after the Lawrence Welk show, and then we did. We we still. Let's see, Ron and I were divorced in 1984, but we still, up until last year, up until the COVID thing hit in 2020, we were still doing performances around the country. You know, that's, un, that's unusual. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. 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 She, uh, she has to be a pretty good gal to, you know, put up with you. She put up with me. Yeah. That's for darn sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I'm but glad, she's I'm such a talent. Did, she's you such you a really talent. did make a good duo. But y'all, y'all still performed up until like last yeah. year, last couple well, of years. Did. Well, any future plans for that? No, we kind of retired. We figured that uh, when everything shut down in 2020, that was kind of a not be a, a sign that it's the time to stop traveling the country. So I don't do much in. I sing around town here, around Mississippi, and um, sing a lot at church. I've become the resident funeral singer now. I've gone from wedding singer to funeral singer. You know, when you get our age, it's uh, if you're still alive, it's going to be a bunch of your friends that aren't. So yeah. that's... Uh, the circle is tightening. There's no question yeah. about that. Well, um, you know, right about that time when, when you hung it up with Lawrence Welk, I was looking back through some stuff, and you also performed with a lot of, a lot of interesting folks like Dinah Shore. You performed with her and Jim Neighbors. Oh, we did. Right? Ron and I did all the. Everybody that had a show, we did it. Merv Griffin, Mike Douglas, Johnny Jim Carson, Neighbors, Johnny, Johnny Carson. Carson. We did all of those shows, and we did a lot of game shows. Those were really fun because every you did, you did, those were all. Uh, all the money you got on those went to charities. And, uh, yeah, well, that was speaking fun. of, I'm, I found something else that I'm sure you didn't, you haven't told a bunch of folks, but I'm going to put it out. Oh, here it is. Just for y'all's information, it talks about working. Um, he, he was one of the stars of Mississippi Rising, which was a nationwide television special that raised millions of dollars for Hurricane Katrina recovery efforts in, in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. and, and he's received special recognition for his charitable work in the, uh, with the American Cancer Society, the March of Dimes, and Child Health USA. And he has been voted Volunteer of the Year for his work in the Jackson, Mississippi metro community and received acclaim for his work with military veterans and their families during Operation Desert Shield, Desert Storm, Enduring Freedom, and Iraqi Freedom. Freedom. <coughs> Where'd you, you find know, all I, that? I, I've been doing some digging, so about you. I, I, we're not going to say anything oh. about the mug shots or any of that, but uh, <laughs> I, you know, I saw well, that, and I, I, I didn't know that. And I guarantee you, nine nine point nine percent of folks didn't know it, and that they just ought to. That's all. Well, what I thought. I don't know. I, I don't do near as much volunteering now as I ought to. Well, uh, now that I have way more time than I did back in those days, but uh, anyhow, it's, uh, I still do as much as I can for charities I really have an interest in, and it's um, you know I went from. When I moved back to Mississippi, moved back to Mississippi in like 1990, the late 1990s. And uh, I was been knocking around down here for a couple of years. And uh, my old friend Trent Lott called me. He said, what are you doing these days? <laughs> I said, well, I'm still scratching around, singing here and there. And uh, gotten back to Mississippi, which is really good. Well, he'd gotten elected to the United States Senate. Uh, his first year was 89, I think. He'd been trying to run his state offices, which he had six of at the time, for out, out of Washington. And he said, I really need somebody on the ground down there I trust, and would you be interested? And I said, man, I don't know anything about politics. I've been in show business for 20 years. He just smiled and said, you'll do fine. <laughs> 
Oh, did I not know what he was getting me into, though. But whoa, what an education it was learning about the government, the federal bureaucracy, and all the stuff we did in the state offices was trying to help people wade through the red tape stuff to get help from Social Security and VA and stuff like that. But it was it was a, a really good experience, and I appreciated my my friend Senator Trent for giving me that opportunity. Yeah, well, now he's back in Mississippi now. Right? He's well residing here. Yeah, he? he still runs back and forth to Washington. He's still with a, a lobbying group up there. He and he and Senator John Bro had formed their own lobbying group right after they got out of the Senate. And, and then they got bought out by some big firm and another big firm. So he finally said, I'm getting out of this big firm business. So he went and joined a smaller firm, but uh, he's still doing it. He's still got a bunch of clients. And, but uh, he and his wife, Tricia, have uh, moving to Oxford, Mississippi. Yeah, yeah. Well, they had a wonderful place here out in Pocahontas. And, uh, but the daughters moved up there. The grandkids are both at Ole Miss. Hey, it was a natural thing for him to do. Well, I remember you were doing some of that we had a meeting up here in Madison County, and the governor, I think it was Barber, Haley Barber, came up and talked to us, and we were in a tent out there. And you sang a song. You sang Jim Weatherly's song. Yeah. But, but Mississippi. Mississippi, this is your song. And Mississippi, this is your song. And when you got through, Haley Barber told his aide, don't ever let me follow that guy again. <laughs> Boy, you were outstanding. I was sitting there, I couldn't believe you. I'm going uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to ask you in a few minutes to sing that for us. Uh, you know, I'll be glad to. I tell you what, it, you uh, so, I, we've always, I always, we pushed for that song for ten years to make it a state song. It just, no, it just wasn't the right timing because now we've got a a new state song. I think we're gonna have more than one now. They're gonna have categories, but yeah, it is a great song by my late friend Jimmy Weatherly. Did well, you know him well, well, Jim Weather? Do you know him well? We grew up together. He yeah. was in Pontotoc, um, Tupelo, like 15 miles apart. He came, he played, his band played for our high school dances. And now, Jim was also a quarterback at Ole Miss. Boy, big time. And, and, and the team I, of I, heard, I saw something not too long ago, you probably knew, but he was, somebody said something to him one night about taking a midnight train to Memphis. Yeah. And he thought that would be a great title for a song. So he wrote it, yeah. Midnight Train to Memphis, and somebody presented it to um, Gladys. Gladys Knight. And she, who was Gladys Knight in the Pilts at yeah. that time, I guess, and she mm -hmm. she didn't ruin that, really excited about it, and asked him if she might not change the name to train Georgia. To Georgia. Midnight Train to Georgia. He said, yeah. sure, she did. And it just blew past everything else to the top, didn't it? Yeah, but he could have retired off that one song. My goodness. Well, he wrote a bunch of them. Yeah, he was a great writer. Yeah. Great friend. Boy, it was a shocking loss. Uh, we lost him a couple of years ago. Yeah, he, you know, he, was, uh, he was a good one. Uh, I didn't. I didn't know that y'all had been that close early on. But. Yeah, we went to California about the same time. Uh, really? Yeah. I thought he went to Nashville. I thought he wound up in Nashville. No, he took his band, the Gordian Knot, out to L.A. And uh, he knocked around a lot out there. He wrote a lot while he was in L.A. But uh, he, he wound up in Nashville. Yeah, and probably after 2000, I think he probably moved to Nashville. Hmm. But, well, we... uh have gotten up to the present now. Yeah. Would you well, tell us about your bride now and well, your family? I, I was going to say the last time we did this when we had that technical difficulty, <laughs> we never did get around to the best part of my life for the last 20 plus years, which is uh, I met, met this wonderful girl from Mississippi Delta whose uh, brother actually was Trent Lott's chief of staff, hmm. and John Lundy. And through John, I think it was John's 40th birthday party, I met his sister, Sarah Louise Lundy, who had just moved back over here. She had been at uh, 
So I can't remember the name of that hospital in, in Monroe. Uh, anyhow, she'd been there for 10 years working at that hospital uh, as the nurse administrator. She's a, she's a registered nurse, but she's the last 20 years, she was like an administration. So she had just moved back to Jackson and we met and uh, she told me we had met at her brother's wedding some 20 years before that. I said, well, don't hold me to that now. <laughs> <laughs> Can't remember what I am. We were both married to somebody else at the time. <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, uh, we started dating uh, and decided that uh, we were old enough that we better not waste a whole bunch of years fooling around here. So we got married in uh, January, February of 2002. Right, this is your and 20th, 20th year. I just looked yeah, that up. It, here's a picture, picture of us. I don't know where this was from. But there's the girl. There's the light of my life. Oh, she, man, is, she is a lot better looking than you. I can tell you that. <laughs> well, you know, it ain't hard to do, but <laughs> she's a sweetheart. And uh, yes, sir. guys, my friends kid me and say, Went and married a nurse when you're old age. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> well, um, I wasn't gonna say anything. That, 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 no, that was. <laughs> she is a dandy boy. No question about that. Look, we have kind of uh, gotten to the stage where I think folks would kind of like to hear you sing that song. If you, I'll give it a you, shot. I left my water outside, but. Uh, well, well, I can get you some water if you think need some. If, if we can, if we can get a, just a swallow to get, get tuned up, has dried me out. And, uh, get tuned out, up, and I will be right back. It's in tune. You've got to you, understand, sir. folks, this is a low rent operation, or I would have had him something to drink. But I had a bottle of water in my hand, and I wanted we'll, to do. We'll give you your money back. You're but, not like satisfied. <laughs> Let's see if I can get this thing in. <clears throat> Jimmy Weathers, Mississippi, this is your song. She was a proud and great lady, standing tall, with her head held high. Then a war came along and broke her heart, left her there to die. With her gown and tattered tricks, she raised her very head. I messed up. I got to start that again. <laughs> All right. That's right. With her gown and her shreds, she raised her very head and bowed. She'd rise again. Looking back to yesterday, just come a long, long way since then. Mississippi. This is your song Sung for all those righteous people Who won't let you forget when you were wrong In the past they've written songs For everything red, white, and blue It's been a long time coming, so Mississippi, here's one for you. Well, I was born into her family, and I was raised on the labors of her field. And neath the summer sun's warm haze, she let me run across her meadows and her hills. And yet she's still the last in line when the path I pull and runs about the land. 
land of the free. Lord, she still misunderstood, but she's been mighty good to me. So, Mississippi, yeah, this is your song. Sung for all those righteous people who were meant to begin when you were wrong. In the past, they've written songs for everything to red, white, and blue. It's been a long time coming, so Mississippi. This one is for you. Mississippi. This is your song. Well, now you will understand, folks, why Haley Barber did not want to follow him. And so we have covered everything, guy, I think, except maybe children and grandchildren now. And you got a few of those. Yes, too, right? we do, sis and I together have three children. My daughter lives in Phoenix. Her son, they just moved back to Oxford. And her daughter lives in South Louisiana. We got five grandkids. Got a six and an eight year old. All oh, right. Oh, the mercy of son, I'm gonna have to live be, be nanny or something. We'll, we'll see them graduate. Bring them out to Richie's roof. We got some brim and bass out here. They probably would like to the catch. They love the fish. They, they love it. Right. Yes, sir. I cannot tell you how much I appreciate you coming out here. At least at the second time after I screwed up the first. If I screwed up this one, <laughs> uh, I will not call you again. Hey, so I know the way now. Well, so. Yeah, we're looking forward to having you and sis out whenever you can. So come back to see us when you can, buddy, and I thank you so much for this. Thank you, Jim.